Okay, so we moved on from the Jurassic, going back in time to the Triassic period. Now I'm here on top of Green's Hill, and right behind me is this fantastic cliff face, which is from the middle Triassic period. At the very top of the cliff, we've got the Tarpauli formation, and then about halfway down, we've got the Helsby formation. Now, we're talking about 242 to about 247 million years ago for both these formations. There's a series of hills just north of Shrewsbury, Nescliff, Harmer, and the one that we're on right now, Grins Hill. And these are the southern edge of a syncline. Now, the syncline goes underneath North Shropshire and Cheshire and emerges again in North Cheshire in places around Helsby, Frodham, and Runcorn. Now, one of the things you might notice about this cliff face is that it's red. And this is a characteristic feature of most of the Triassic and the Permian sandstone formations throughout not just Shropshire but also the entirety of the British Isles. So much so that it became colloquially known as the New Red Sandstone Formation. And yes, there is an Old Red Sandstone Formation, which I will get into in a later episode. Now, this isn't just the only place in Shropshire that you will find Triassic sandstone formations. If we head over to Bridge North, you'll see what I mean. Right now, I'm in the Hermitage Park just above Bridge North, and the cliffs behind me, just here, are part of the Triassic Formation. So this colour is the result of hematite, fusing the sand grains together, being left behind as water evaporates, encoded in the sand grains. Now, you might notice that this red colour is actually predominant throughout all of these formations, and this is no accident. The Triassic world is one that was very, very different from the Jurassic world that we saw previously. It was a very dry, very arid landscape. And part of the evidence for this is that hematite being left over from the evaporation. Another thing you might have noticed is these bands. We've got them going this way. We've got here, this way, changing direction again, further up, changing direction again. Now this is a, f a formation called cross bedding. Now cross bedding, particularly here in Bridge North, is the result of sand dunes. And what happens is you have the winds blowing over the top of the sand dune, pushing the grains over to the side, uh, over the um, leeward side of the sand dune, and this over time this causes the sand dunes to move. And the result is that the base of the sand dunes you get the remains of these, these cross bedding formations. So when the wind direction, the prevailing wind direction changes, you also get a change in the direction of the sand dunes. Hence why you've got these cross bedding patterns throughout the cliffs. You'll also find areas of conglomerate. Now these are the remains of river channels that cut through the sand, sand dunes at a later date and through the sandstone. And you can see here, there is a top of the formation on the cliffs of Bridge North, a quite spectacular um, remains of a ri ephemeral river system. So this mixture of conglomerate and sandstone on the top of the cliffs above Bridge North is referred to as the Chester Formation. And it is about 147 to 150 million years old, which puts it at the beginning of the Triassic period. Now, as we go further down the cliffs, we enter the Permian period. And the Permian is very poorly represented throughout much of the UK, but it is very, very similar to the Triassic formation behind me. And as I'll explain later, there is a reason why for this. Okay, so at the base of the cliffs at Bridge North, and behind me we've got the what's called the Bridge North Sandstone Formation, which is late Permian, middle of late Permian, uh, about 170 million years old. Now, you might have noticed that it looks almost identical to the Triassic formations that we saw at the top of the cliffs. We've got the same orange, rusty red-brown colour. We've got the same cross laminations. And basically, we're looking at pretty much the same environments. A desert environment, 
um, that spanned not just most of Shropshire, not just the UK, but pretty much the entire world. Now, though most people probably haven't heard of the Permian, a lot of people will be familiar with the concept of a single global continent called Pangaea, and that was during the Permian. The, it started to break up during the end of the Jurassic, uh, started to break up during the end of the Triassic period. Okay. So one of the other features of the Triassic sandstone formations we've got are the grains are very well sorted and they're also really well rounded. There is a general lack of fossils and what fossils we do find are terrestrial ones such as Ragosaurus and these are small reptiles that have been found in several places throughout the county of Shropshire. So when we combine the information of the hematite, the cross bedding, the terrestrial fossils, the ephemeral river systems, and the well-rounded and well-sorted sand grains. What we've got is the remains of a desert system, something akin to the Sahara today. Okay, so we've seen in Bridge North the evidence that the Triassic and the Permian were both very arid environments. Now, there are lots of different reasons for this. Part of it is to do with the fact that Pangaea was one single landmass, all the continents were all connected together. And this meant that there was very little rainfall that could penetrate inland into the continent. And this led to a desert environment becoming the norm throughout a lot of Pangaea. Now there is another secret hidden in this arid landscape. And it's a much, much darker one. The Triassic and the Permian are a time when life was pushed right to the edge. This is about as close as life ever got to actually being eradicated from the planet. Now, we tend to think of mass extinctions with things like the dinosaur extinction at the end of the Cretaceous. It tends to be quite a well-known one. And yet the Cretaceous extinction was a big, big extinction. About 74, 75% of species disappeared from the fossil record. So there's a mass extinction that took place in the Permian the Triassic. And the most recent one of these was the Triassic to Jurassic extinction about 201 million years ago. And with this one, there were about 42% of all terrestrial species disappear from the fossil record. Now the Triassic extinction is linked to the breakup of Pangaea and a large period of volcanic activity known as the Central Atlantic Magmatic Province, which can be found in parts of Western Europe, Western Africa, Eastern South America and Eastern North America. Now, that was a big extinction. In a world where life had already been pushed to the limit, that really, really caused some problems. And as I said, it led to the rise of the dinosaurs of the dominant land animals on the planet. About 230 million years ago, about halfway through the Triassic, there was a Carnian pluvial event which is basically a break in the arid conditions that are laid down in the rocks behind me. And what happened was it rained for about two million years. And although it's not evidence in Shropshire, but other parts of the world start to see um, coal forests start to emerge again. Now, the cunning pluvial event is linked to the Wrangian basalt volcanic activity that took place in Alaska and Western Canada at about the same time and this changed the atmospheric composition and led to increased rainfall and it allowed rain clouds to penetrate into Pangaea to provide some much needed rainfall to this arid desert. Now the Carnian pluval event caused the extinction of one of the great survivors of the Permian and Triassic, which is the Lystrosuchus, and a whole bunch of other dicynodonts also became extinct at this time. And this gave the leg up to the archosaurs and Lepidosaurs, which eventually led to the dominance of pterosaurs, plesiosaurs, ichthyosaurs, and of course, dinosaurs. Now, at the early, before that, the early Triassic, there was the Smithian Spathian extinction about 249 million years ago. Now, this one was a predominantly marine extinction, and the temperature of the ocean, oceans in the tropics had really risen up to about 40 degrees Celsius. Now, to put that in comparison, 
the Gulf of Mexico is the hottest part of the oceans today and that has summer temperatures around about 26 27 at its highest so we're talking a bathtub hot for all these seas during the beginning of the triassic now this increase in temperature meant that species that couldn't handle the heat went extinct we lose about 40 percent of bivalve species during this event and other mobile species fled towards the poles and this sees the emergence of more modern um, species of coral. And then there's the mother of all extinctions, the end Permian Triassic extinction, which took place about 252 million years ago. It is the biggest mass extinction in the fossil record, far outstripping the end Cretaceous one that took out the dinosaurs. We're talking about massive, massive extinction and a dramatic loss of biodiversity that really took most of the Triassic period for the Earth to recover. Now, part of this is down to the fact that the world was a very harsh, hot and arid environment to begin with, which always pushes life to the edge when there's the, such a lack of water. Um, but there was one particular event that really pushed life to the extreme and it's related to a massive area of volcanic activity centered around Siberia in Russia known as the Siberian Traps. Now the Siberian Traps was a an event called a flood basalt which there really isn't anything in the world right now that compares to a flood basalt. The earth opened up and it poured out massive amounts of molten rock and volcanic gases and it did this for close to 80,000 years and it covered an area of about 70 million square kilometers which is almost the size of Europe with kilometers thick layers of volcanic rock. The, uh, now this had the effect of changing the atmospheric composition making the atmosphere more toxic it also ignited a lot of the coal deposits that have been laid down before the Permian during the Carboniferous which again caused some significant problems it ended up with this very toxic atmosphere it also led to increased acidification of the oceans something that we're concerned about here in the 21st century as well they led to the release of methane hydride which again was a greenhouse ga gas that leaked out into the water in the oceans now this would have been bad enough but the actual existence of Pangaea also helped to exacerbate the problem. Pangaea was one single landmass slapped onto the side of the earth. Now what this did was this caused problems with global ocean circulation. So you ended up with essentially dead zones within the ocean that became anoxic, so a complete lack of oxygen within the water and this killed off a lot of the marine life and it's one of the reasons why marine life suffered most during this extinction. Now one of the knock-on effects of the anoxic uh, environment within the oceans was you end up with a preponderance of anaerobic bacteria and one of the byproducts of these anaerobic organisms is hydrogen sulfide and this hydrogen sulfide is also toxic to most life and it led to the uh, increased poisoning of the oceans and the atmosphere. And a funny little quirk of the hydrogen sulfide is that when it's in the ocean water, it's actually pink. So if you'd have got, seen Earth from space during the end Permian mass extinction, you'd have had a pink purple planet. So that's the organisms that lost out, pretty much everything lost out. One group in particular of note are the trilobites, which had for hundreds of millions of years been one of the dominant animal species within the oceans. Now because of the anoxic conditions, it was a lot of bottom dwelling organisms that really, really suffered during the end Permian extinction and the trilobites was one of them. The cynaspids, who were the ancestors of mammals, also suffered as did the diaspids. However, the diaspids, which are the ancestors of modern reptiles and birds, um, did manage to rebound quicker than the cyanaspids. 
which is why you start to get reptiles becoming the dominant creatures as we go into the Triassic period. This mass extinction at the end of the Permian was so extreme that it has become known colloquially as the Great Dying and it was about as close as the Earth had ever got to having life wiped off it. So if we take our geological map of Shropshire and add the Permian and Triassic layers to it, you can see how much of the county is covered by rocks of this age. Now, a lot of it in North Shropshire in particular is covered under metres and metres and metres of glacial till, so sadly there's not a lot of exposure there. There are some places we've seen in this episode where you can see the red rocks from this time period. In our next episode, we're going to go to the Carboniferous period.